You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 271. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hello, veggie lovers. Welcome back to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today I have Dr. Sandra Musial, which has a super interesting journey and a lot of things we can learn from. Before I tell you more about her, remember that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about you or your child's eating, nutrition, or growth, please consult a doctor. Sandy is a physician specializing in food as medicine who believes that the foundation of a healthy life starts with whole plant-based food. She earned a BS degree in nutritional sciences and an MD degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She has worked in a private practice at Hasbro Children's Hospital, teaching the pediatric residents and medical students. She is a culinary coach from Harvard Chef coaching program, has a certificate in plant-based nutrition from eCornell, and a health coaching certificate from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Sandy is board certified in pediatrics and obesity medicine and started an obesity clinic and the first vegetable garden at Hasbro. Though she has witnessed the healing power of conventional medicine, she has also seen its limitations, especially with regard to disease prevention through healthy nutrition. Sandy started the nonprofit Plant Docs as an avenue for people to learn about the power of plant-based nutrition to preserve health and even reverse many chronic diseases. Sandy enjoys gardening, yoga, knitting, and sweater alchemy. And if you don't know what sweater alchemy is, she's going to answer that question. I was surprised. I had never heard of it, and that's not what I imagined it was. So if you're curious, definitely keep listening to the end. So in this episode, we talk about her vegan plant-based journey, which began almost 20 years ago. We talk about how she started integrating those principles into her work as a physician. We also get into a little discussion about the AAP new obesity guidelines for children. Her thoughts, my thoughts, I get a little emotional. I had to calm myself down a little bit. Um, We also talk about her thoughts on the limitations of conventional medicine and chronic disease prevention and treatment, how her perspective might be different from other physicians working in uh, the space of obesity medicine. We also talk about teaching medical students and residents and medical education and its evolution. And we talk about Plant Docs, her nonprofit, and how excited, enthusiastic, and how much she's loving it. So I hope that you really enjoyed this episode and getting to know Sandy a little bit more and her journey. Thank you so much to all your new listeners that have come to visit Veggie Doctor Radio. I hope that you stick around and listen to some of the older episodes and share with friends and family. And welcome back to all my weekly listeners. Thank you so much for being here. And now let's welcome Dr. Sandra Musial. Dr. Sandra Musial, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, I am so excited to get to know you a little bit more. And before we get more into your career and some burning questions that I have, (laughs) tell us about your vegan plant-based journey. Well, uh, I guess it started after I became a doctor and I was working as a pediatrician in a private practice. And one of my, the mothers of a family asked me if I had read the China study. And I didn't know what she was talking about. And after um, reading it and being enlightened to this kind of other way of thinking that wasn't what I had learned in medical school, Um, It wasn't what I was practicing as a pediatrician. 
I certainly was a milk pusher. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it kind of opened my eyes that, huh, you know, just because I went to medical school and didn't get much nutrition education, um, and I was following the AA, the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines, um, it was really in conflict with what I was reading. And so I took a deep dive into just wanting to know more about nutrition. And that's how it all started. Wow, I love that. And you know, sometimes it can be so hard for families because doctors are an authority and you know, we have so much training and experience and it can be intimidating to bring up new ideas, especially ideas that seem to radically conflict with our guidelines and what we say over and over and over again. But I identify with that so strongly because I too was immersed in the milk or die sort of thing, you know, like everybody had to have milk and the older you got, the more milk. And it was just like milk for everybody, despite <laughs> the fact that I was seeing with my own eyes, the issues it was causing. But you have like this block because you're like, well, you need it. Like it's healthier to have it than to not have it. So we'll just do workarounds around all of these issues, you know? So once you started learning about it, what was most shocking to you? I mean, that was the, the biggest thing for me was just this whole milk issue. And, and I really, you know, all my colleagues, you know, all my people, you know, in pediatrics didn't see any problem with it. So, you know, that, that was the biggest kind of sticking point. And, um, and it took me a while to really kind of read a lot of the research and be convinced that milk just isn't, cow's milk is not a good idea for for humans and for children. Um, but it's still like that was 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And, you know, the, have the AAP guidelines changed for, you know, milk? It, so I, I, I feel like, you know, it kind of led me to like that one point um, has, has caused a lot of internal conflict with me in my profession. And, um, and eventually I left pediatrics and I'm now, you know, um, treating adults. <laughs> nice. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit too, but I agree. I think I've always, since I was little, been like this truster of authority and people that know more than me. I'm always assumed that everybody knows more than me. And, um, I think it was also just really a big letdown, a big disappointment when I started to learn these things, not just about how some of these foods could be harming us and we were all immersed in like, these are health foods, but also just like the whole industry, right? Like I've always been so trusting of like governmental guidelines and all of this. And it wasn't until finding out, oh my gosh, this is so complex. There's so many players involved in this and so much special interest involved that you don't understand until you start learning about it, that you kind of let down and you're just like, man, I really trusted everybody to do what was best for me. And um, I think it, it really takes some deliberate action to really find things out sometimes. But thankfully, I think that there's more professionals and more people out there that are deliberate about learning about these things and spreading it to others. And so I think that's been helpful as well. Yeah. But so, along, along oh, those lines of saying like you were disappointed and, and almost, and just disenchanted, um, yes. because another phase of my career was becoming board certified in obesity medicine. And I was opening, um, with a colleague, um, an obesity clinic for children at Hasbro Children's Hospital. And I thought, all right, I'm going to learn the best, most up-to-date, you know, information on treating obesity and by getting board certified. And I took the course, the Harvard Blackburn co course on obesity. And, and I had that same feeling, like I kept waiting for enlightenment <laughs> and realizing this was, it was the same kind of information. And so much of it was just about pharmacology and um, risks of, um, you know, bariatric surgery and it and there was very little spoken about you know eating whole foods plant-based unrefined you know it was all about low carb high carb high fat and it was like very disappointed yeah that reminds me i was in airport once 
I don't even know how this happened. Some stranger came and sat at my table while I was at the airport in a layover and also happened to be a pediatrician who subscribed to the keto for children paradigm. Mm. And I was already plant-based at the time, felt great, you know, predominantly whole foods, all of this stuff. And he was super passionate, obviously, start talking about how it's going to be the best way. It's going to decrease, you know, obesity, all this stuff. And when I disagreed with him and, and talked about the dangers of that kind of diet for children, he was like, well, have you tried it? And I was like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> and he was like, well, and he got super offended. He was like, well, if you haven't tried it, then, you know, you can't talk about it. And I'm like, okay. Um, but I, to me, it was very alarming that there are people in that camp putting children on a ketogenic diet for, for body size when it's so, it's so sad. <laughs> Even when I have my children that have to be on it for epilepsy management how difficult it is for them to be on a ketogenic diet. And it's literally could be life-saving for them, you know, but yeah, um, yeah it's, I was, I was very shocked by that. And I, I think it's true that we have this growing camp of like, it has to be a high fat or low carb diet um, in order to make a change. Well, let's go back again before we, we talk about some of the ideas you may have currently about what's going on with children and body size and all of that. When, at what point did you start integrating plant-based nutrition principles into your work as a physician? Did you start integrating it into your practice 20 years ago or how did that work? No, that was very challenging. It, it started as more a personal journey when I was reading about it. And it's like, it seemed like a different universe than, you know, what I was doing as a pediatrician. So in the whole food plant-based world, I was going to lectures and reading lots of books and I was giving the China study to all my family members. And then I started seeing people changing their lives. My brother um, lost 50 pounds, reversed his um, high cholesterol, dropped his blood pressure, didn't need to go on meds. And I was like, and, and in his mind, I like saved his life. And so it was very profound to see this complete health turnaround in my brother so then I, you know, and then all the people in my inner circle were so curious about what I was doing and what this meant. And, and more and more people started adopting this and, and seeing real life-changing results. When I flip back to pediatrics, um, my focus became how can I get kids to eat more fruits and vegetables as, as a starting point instead of, you know, thinking whole food, plant-based, um, I started with try to get in five servings of fruits and vegetables, the 5210, you know, try to, um, it stands for five, um, get in five fruits and vegetables every day, no more than two hours of screen time, one hour of vigorous exercise, and zero sugar sweetened beverages. So I tried to, you know, and that was in line with the AAP guidelines. Um, so I felt like there's some common ground there. Um, so I had more focus there and also trying to get um, a switch to more whole grains as far as the um, carbohydrates, less processed and more, um, you know, brown rice rather than white rice, little baby steps changing there and having parents maybe consider beans as a protein source. A lot of our families were Hispanic and had this deep rooted, you know, rice, beans and meat on the plate and I tried to switch it to brown rice, beans and vegetables <laughs> as an alternative, like sticking within the cultural norms, but making it a little healthier, but that's challenging. Yeah. Where were you practicing at the time? Um, in Southern Rhode Island at a group um, pediatric practice. There were six of us. Yeah. yeah. Did you find any difficulty or struggle with your other colleagues as far as like conflicting advice or anything like that? No, I think they were all in agreement with what I just said. The milk thing was another issue. Um, I, I, I think what, you know, yes, there's an alternative to cow's milk. How about giving soy milk or almond milk? You know, there weren't as many options back then. There was really just soy mm -hmm. milk. And I remember rice milk was mm -hmm. gross, but out there, I never liked it. <laughs> but, um, only, you know, when kids had allergies, did parents consider, you know, something other than cow's milk. So 
there wasn't a lot of conflicts. Okay. Well, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. Well, let's get into some of the things I have a burning curiosity about given your experience in obesity medicine. We recently had the release of a pretty controversial set of uh, guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics on childhood obesity. So I'm just wondering what your opinion is of those and what your thoughts are after those have been released. Yeah, well, the overarching goal, I think, of having these recommendations was, um, I think, successful in bringing attention to the epidemic of overweight and obese children, and we need to do something, and we can't just ignore it. Um, We need to address it, and we need to address it early. So I like that. I like um, expanded um, testing, um, lab testing, because I I witnessed myself, sometimes parents were in disagreement with physicians about whether the weight was an issue or not. So if a child was in an overweight or early obese range, the parent might say, no, I think they look healthy, um, where the doctors would, it would be flagged. This is, at this point, I had switched and I'm working up at an academic center. Um, and the, the residents that I was working with you know, would be aware that they're now in this kind of unhealthier weight range. But If along with that, we did labs and they were like, oh my God, my child is high cholesterol, you know, at whatever age, like then it, it mattered. Like it struck them as now this child is, it's not just a disagreement about perception of weight, but it's a health issue. Mm -hmm. So I do like that, um, there's maybe increased awareness and I think an expansion of the, the age at which we're testing for like fatty liver disease, type two diabetes, um, and, and hyperlipidemia. The, I think the controversial part is the starting of medication and early bariatric surgery. Um, what, but before that they have this, you know, intensive lifestyle intervention and behavioral modification. Yeah, it's a lot of words. And what does it actually mean? And is it is that really happening? Like that, those recommendations were kind of there before, but not as black and white. And and that's exactly what we were doing in the um, pediatric obesity clinic. We called it the health clinic for healthy eating, active living through Hasbro. Um, and the focus was on anybody with a BMI over 85% would be referred to our clinic and we would have more time to spend with them and focus on, you know, what are you eating and, you know, using motivational interviewing to help the family shift to a healthier lifestyle and a more active lifestyle. I think that's good. So I think, do you agree? Like the, the biggest controversy is, is the lowered age at which to start, um, obesity medications and surgery. Well, (laughs) my feelings on body size are kind of just so radical now compared to other people that I, I mean, I definitely feel like one of the things that I really liked about it is that it did explain in, you know, it was a very long report that body size is multifactorial. Um, So it's not just one thing and it's not as easy as eat less and move more. And in general, a lot of kids, especially younger kids are super active already, you know? So I think for me, the hardest thing about everything I think is over-focusing on body size. I think that personally, my opinion is that we should take the focus off of body size and more on actual habits and behaviors for everybody. Because I guarantee you, if we started universally screening people for universally screening children, there's going to be a lot of children within that normal BMI because they eat the exact same foods as the larger body children. Because right now in the United States, children are deriving 70% of their calories from ultra processed foods. So yeah, some of them, for whatever reason, genetics, you know, the way their metabolism works, whatever, they're not going to end up with a larger body size, but metabolically, they're still at the same risk. So these other children that, yeah, genetically, they're just predisposed to put on more subcutaneous fat. Once that subcutaneous fat stores build up, yes, maybe they're going to have more visceral fat earlier than the kids that are smaller body size, but 
all the kids are at risk. All the kids in America are at risk right now. So we're in an epidemic of everybody eating too many ultra processed foods. And what I worry about when we start getting too aggressive with pointing out body size in children, that it's really going to backfire on us because I know it backfired for me. And so I think for me, it's because I have personal experience with this. And to me, it just, I take it personally, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I think that's the difference for me uh, is that I just feel like we need to be super cautious. And they do talk about that on there. But I think that most physicians, especially people that have not struggled with their own body size and have not had an experience of disordered eating and eating disorders, they are not going to understand how important that is to approach this with caution to just one statement, especially in the right personality type for a child is going to set them on a path of lifelong misery about their body size and weight. And it's going to take the focus off of just eat more vegetables and eat more whole foods. That's not the focus anymore. The focus is you need to be leaner. You need to be leaner, not just to be healthy, but to be accepted and to be loved. That's where it translates to with, for a mm -hmm. child. So that's what I worry about. And I feel like that's where the majority of the conflict comes from. I think, yeah, people are like, oh my God, how can you recommend that you know, a little child in the single digits start on medications or get weight loss surgery or, or that kind of thing? I think, yes, that's what people are saying. But I think there's also a community that's like, are we getting too aggressive with pointing out body size and that can lead to other consequences. So I feel like overall, it was a really good, well-researched report that has some really good things in there. Most people probably didn't actually read the whole thing. And a lot of physicians aren't going to look into the whole background of like multifactorial causes of body size and how to approach it in families that causes the least harm for the children. So that's my feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I, I hear you. I agree with it. I, yeah. I do think, um, you know, obesity, um, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease. I mean, now that I'm seeing adults, uh, the four reasons, the four biggest, most common reasons I see adults are the high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obesity, and type two diabetes and their comorbidities. They, mm -hmm. they, they kind of travel together. I, I do like, um, that I think, I don't know if it was that report I read somewhere, you know, it's not that necessarily that the obesity is causing one thing or another because it is so multifactorial, whatever's yes. causing these four things with, um, life with lifestyle or where kids are living or, or their, um, you know, access to, um, safe being active and safe outside mm -hmm. or not, um, affect all of those things. But I do think it's a little dangerous to say that, you know, having a larger body or being obese is not kind of a risk or, mm -hmm. or saying that because it's hard because like you could be um, overweight and be healthy. Um, mm -hmm. I understand that. But those, those are comorbidities. And, and when you have excess weight and you're taking in all these ultra processed foods and high fatty fried foods, you know, whether you're overweight or not, it's a risk. Exactly. That's diseases. my point. That's yeah. exactly my point is that we should stop focusing on the body size because mm -hmm. everybody needs to improve their habits. So it's not mm -hmm. like, oh, you need to stop eating French fries because you have a BMI of this. But then in this other child that doesn't yeah. have that high BMI, we're not even going to address it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't, like, I completely 100% agree with you that most children in the United States, we, we need a major overhaul in habits and behaviors. But I, I don't think that the approach should be through focus on the body size. And I know that mm -hmm. that's, for some people, I think it's a little hard for them to understand because it seems like you're saying it doesn't matter. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. it shouldn't be the focus. That shouldn't be our entry point mm -hmm. because it can cause more harm than good in my mm -hmm. opinion. But like I said, I also have a different background. So mm -hmm. I was that kid that started dieting at mm -hmm. eight or nine years old. You know, yeah. I was the kid that was put on a 1200 calorie diet. And, and so, um, and it was all well-meaning. And I know that my family loves me and loved me and my doctor probably cared about me and, but it caused lots and lots and 
decades of harm, decades mm. of harm, mm. you know? So as still recovering from that, I still don't feel like I fully recovered from it. And that's why I take yeah. it so personally that I don't want other children to be thrown into that world because to me, it's a bigger issue, right? To me, it's whenever you start worrying so much or focusing so much on your body size, develop disordered eating or eating disorders, or even just give up and start binging or whatever and say, whatever, I'm never going to be able to change anyway. And you're always focusing on these things. It just takes away from their joy and their potential in life where they could be contributing to society and the world in bigger, better ways, or even just experiencing more joy and radiating that joy. So to me, it's like a huge issue, you know, mm -hmm. but now I'm getting, I'm, I'm totally on my high horse and getting That's on okay. the soapbox <laughs> here. So, but thank you for letting me go off of that. So let's, let's transition a little bit to talk about some of the stuff, some of the work that you do now and why you transitioned away from pediatrics into what you're doing. So tell me a little bit about what your opinions are on the limitations of conventional medicine when it comes to chronic disease prevention and or treatment. Yeah, I think it's huge. <laughs> I don't feel like it, in in like conventional medicine we're addressing the root cause of these chronic diseases. We're so focused and trained to treat pathology, to give medications, to do surgeries, and we're not trained to just take a look at the whole person and figure out how are they sleeping? What is their stress level? What are the other stuff in their lives that might be interfering with the ability to have um, a healthy lifestyle? And, and I think a lot of times it just gets ignored where as physicians, there's under the time restraints and you have to get in and out and the billing and like, it was like a rat race. I, I couldn't wait to get out of that system. Um, and I wanted to really focus on nutrition and so that's why, you know, I did this obesity clinic was part of, I was also, you know, uh, overseeing the residents in a regular um, sick and well clinic. It was great fun. I loved working with the residents and the medical students and, and teaching them. But I, when I was working in the obesity clinic, I felt like we could have been doing so much more to, to help everybody. So one of the things that I did while I was there was I did a study, um, on the prevention of the introduction of um, sugar, sugar sweetened beverages and juice in um, infants and toddlers, because yeah. we started talking about a study, and I don't, I don't want to wait till the kids are five or ten. Like the, we got to work with everybody. So we just, it was like all comers and all the births at our hospital, and we split them into two groups. One got like an intervention to try to um, educate early. So they, they don't start them. Because once you start them, it's hard to, to back up. It's hard to get out of that habit. But um, it, it was a lot of work. It took a lot of time. And, uh, and, and it, we, we moved the needle on education, but we didn't move the needle on behavioral change or outcome like the, in the weights of kids. So I, I don't know. Maybe that will translate to something down the line um, as far as behavioral changes. But... Um, I mean, it's certainly challenging. Yeah. So what you're saying is the parents learned that you probably shouldn't give your kids um, juice and sugar sweetened beverages. And they knew that like whenever you did the surveys, but they were still giving them those beverages. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Correct. <laughs> and they learned that there might be risks like with dental caries and give, you know, but, but they still were giving the same amount of juice three years later. <laughs> Yeah. And what year was that? Um, we did it over a three-year period from maybe like 17, 18, 19, something like that. Okay. Yeah, because I know that also when it comes to things like WIC and what they give as part of their program can also be a major influence. And we get these mixed signals because families are like, yeah, we shouldn't drink juice. We're told not to drink juice, but then we're given juice. And then preschools, they're giving juice and, you know, their juice is a replacement for fruit. It stands in for fruit. Right. And so, yeah. uh, and I still have parents, I feel like it's becoming more common knowledge that kids shouldn't drink juice, but every once in a while, I still have parents that are like, well, that's the way that they get their vitamin C. And I'm like, 
you know that that's like in fruit, right? Like you don't have to get it in like juice form. So, um, so yeah, I think it, it takes a while to change some of that stuff because so many things have to change along with it too, to support that education. So yeah, it's good job prevent- doing the study and giving Thank it a you. good, good college try. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's that prevention piece that, that I really wanted to focus on. And that was how I felt like I had a little bit of an influence. And, and it certainly, I think, made all the residents, the medical students, and everyone who's involved with the study more aware of this issue um, and yeah. the need to educate and try to um, you know, continue that work. Yeah. But I think in general, conventional medicine um, does a terrible job with prevention, and especially with regard to um, nutrition. And so I really wanted to focus on that. And that's how it evolved into um, plant docs, which is what I'm doing now. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and, well, I want to hear a little bit about, and I know that you don't work in the obesity clinic anymore, Mm -hmm. but as, you know, your mindset was changing and you were preparing to exit that field, how do you feel like your perspective was different than the, the environment that you were immersed in? What were like the big pieces that you felt like were in conflict with the traditional way of doing things? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I was working with one other um, pediatrician and and we were in alignment with wanting to just focus on healthy lifestyle changes. And, and, And I agree, like everybody in the clinic needed that information, not just the kids who had an elevated BMI, but this was, you know, how it was set up. And these were the kids that came to us. But that, but I did feel like we were getting special treatment and extra tools to help deal with this. And I kept thinking, we need all of this in the regular clinic too, you know, all of these tools. But what they lacked was the time that we were given, um, you know, in the health clinic to, to you know, really show kids and, and make changes, behavioral modification changes. Um, so I, I don't know. I felt like we did a good job focusing on you know, healthy lifestyles. And there were only two of us. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we worked well together. It's a very different population, uh, just like completely opposite from where I've landed now. And Mm -hmm. I think one of the struggles in that clinic, it was a, it was a lower income clinic, inner city. Um, There was a lack of buy-in, you know, the, the patients were being referred they, they weren't coming because they were like, oh, that sounds awesome. I want to go. <laughs> and a lot of the times it, it was a chaotic clinic. So they would show up and they didn't know why they were even there. And they didn't even know it was talk, to talk about healthy lifestyle and, and nutrition. And they often thought I was a nutritionist, not a doctor. And, um, and then, you know, where what I'm doing now is a program that people pay for and they come to me because they're super motivated and they're fed up with traditional medicine and they want this alternative approach as opposed to me like forcing it down people's throats um, when they're not ready. Exactly. Yeah, because if people aren't, you know, given that trans theoretical model of change, if people aren't a little more advanced there, it doesn't matter how much you try to educate or talk about these things. It's nothing's going to change, right? So, yeah, I I know exactly that feeling because I would have that feeling a lot in residency where now as and I think it's very similar the setup I have now, because now I have my own practice, private practice with a lifestyle medicine emphasis. People come here because they want to be here. And it's a lot, it's a different level of motivation. You know, it really is. All right. So I'm going to throw a random question out at you, but if you had a magic wand and you can make whatever change happen in the United States or in the whole world, what would it be? What would you wish could just change? Oh, good Lord. What a question. <laughs> um, you mean with nutrition and... With anything, yeah. I wish um, everyone had a backyard garden. 
at their house and that this is where everyone's food came from. Not at those middle aisles in the supermarket that is toxic. Yeah. It, I think our food supply is, is horrific and, and it's, I do supermarket tours with people. We call it shop with a doc and people are like, like what, you know, like mo I can't have most, if you, if I'm going to do what you're saying, I can't have 90% of the things in the supermarket. I'm like, I know they, it just makes money, right? They're there to make money, not to make you healthy. Yeah, no, I agree. I feel like our main problem right now is our environment. So if we were to change the environment, I think that would go a long way because talking to people about this stuff, but they're surrounded by all these fast food restaurants and very inexpensive, hyper palatable food that we can all admit is attractive to humans, right? Like all of us succumb either to ice cream or donuts or whatever, but it's just available in so much excess that it feels sometimes like fighting a losing battle, right? So yeah, I agree with you on that one. And of course, growing your own food is such a great experience for adults and children. And when children are part of that, that also increases their acceptance of fruits and vegetables. So I like that. One All other right. thing I Let's... did when I, oh, sorry. No, one, go ahead. One of the, when I was at Hasbro Children's Hospital, um, that was one of the things I did when I was there. I started a, um, the Hasbro Rainbow Garden. It had six different beds and each one was a different color of the rainbow. So wow. we grew, you know, orange little pumpkins and carrots and, you know, radishes and tomatoes. And we had blue peas and blueberries. And, and the, and the whole point was it was right outside the clinic. So the kids could come outside and see all the vegetables growing. And we had like rainbow ribbons hanging from all the different colors. And then we also had annuals in the color of the bed to increase pollination. So there was just so much education around, you know, having that garden show kids what vegetables actually look like growing and maybe inspire them to have their own backyard urban garden of their own. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful idea. That sounds so beautiful too. And I love how y'all had it in the different colors. I bet that was yeah. just so pretty and like all the butterflies and the bees coming around. That was really neat. Yeah, it was gorgeous. <laughs> Tell me, it sounds like you really enjoy teaching and you had a really good time teaching residents, medical students. Were they receptive to some of the principles and concepts that you were teaching them? And what are your perspectives on the future of medicine? Do you have hope with what's coming or tell us your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, what I was teaching was, you know, the AAP guidelines. Um, it's what I had to teach and it was pretty structured. Um, so, but I think what I offered, what, you know, was more of a focus on nutrition than the other pediatricians I worked with. I was definitely, you know, known as more of, they would call me the food Nazi, um, you know, just in kind of enlightening people, what, what a healthy food matters and to talk about it. I think it was really hard. The residents are under such a time restraint, constraint to everything they have to like check the boxes, you know, the seat belts and safety questions and social questions. And, you know, there's so much they have to cover. I guess my little voice was like, nutrition's important. We need to talk about it. We need to guide everyone toward, you know, eating um, healthier. So I think they appreciated that perspective. Um, and I really enjoyed that. It wasn't more about you know, plant-based nutrition, it was more just about healthy choices, um, more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, um, and less processed foods and fast food. It, it's what, you know, they all know, but um, I think seeing me emphasize it helped uh, hopefully translate it to them caring about it more when they get out on their own um, as pediatricians. Yeah, I love that. Um, but now I, um, I'm, you know, I think there's more interest lately about plant-based nutrition and just nutrition in general. There's, at, um, we're affiliated with Brown University um, Medical School, and they have a food and health elective for fourth year medical students, and they have a lifestyle medicine interest group for um, undergraduates. Um, so I've been asked by at all different levels of education to give talks on 
whole food, plant-based nutrition, um, reversal of cardiac disease. I'm actually giving one tonight um, on whole food, plant-based nutrition and reversal of, of cardi cardiac disease. So there's an interest. It's not, I would like it to for everyone at the medical school. So right now it's a subset. It's the, it's the kids that are interested in it that are um, coming, but they're interested and they care and they know about it. And, you know, 20 years ago that it wasn't like that at all. So I'm really optimistic about it moving in that direction. I think there's going to be more and more um, generalization to the whole medical school. Eventually it's painfully slow, but I think it, you know, nutrition should be taught, you know, way more in, in depth and including what we know about the benefits of whole food, plant-based nutrition. Absolutely. And I agree. I, we have a medical school in the town I live in as well. And I've offered to help teach a curriculum on nutrition, lifestyle medicine, but there's no, there's no space in the curriculum. And you know how right. medical education, it changes so slowly. Yes. They're teaching to tests. That's not on yeah. a test. So why yeah. would you waste any time or spend any time teaching something that's not being tested that's going to help these students progress to the next level? So the same, there's like an interest group. There's the pediatrics and lifestyle medicine interest group there. So they have me come and talk to them. But at least like you, I see that there's interest. There's people reaching out to me on social media, students that are wanting to go in this path. How do I do it? How do I learn more? You know, so there is hope, I think, but it's going to be slow at the, the foundational level with teaching medical students and residents. But tell me about plant docs. How did that start? How is it going? And what, what does it encompass? What kind of things are you doing? So it overlapped with my work at um, the hospital. During that time, I met Kim Anderson, who's the owner of Plant City, which is our local um, plant-based food hall and marketplace. And before, um, she had a great story about her son um, asking her and her husband to re to watch um, some of these like Forks Over Knives movie and then sit down and talk about it with him. And so then after watching the movies, her and her husband were like, this is what we want to focus on. This is where we want to invest our money and our time. And so we, um, we met at a wedding of a mutual friend and we just started talking after that. Um, she told me she was thinking of opening this restaurant and that she um, previously had been involved with um, kind of a jump start of sorts. That's what we call our program where they took a group of people in the um, kind of poorest zip code areas of our state and fed them um, adults like healthy whole food plant-based nutrition into the labs before and after to show the outcome. And so she was telling me about this, this study that they did. It was um, with Nelson Campbell and it was impressive. And I was like, I would love to do that. And she's like, she said there was going to be space in the cellar of Plant City called Plant City Cellar, where they were going to do screenings of documentaries, yoga classes, cooking classes, and that she would love for me to, to create something there. And I just got so excited to think about even that just month long thing. I, I thought this is fantastic. So, at, you know, Plant City is the name of the restaurant. So that's why I named it Plant Docs, um, kind of thinking it was like, you know, they were happening together. And so when Plant City opened, we had, I had found two other doctors to partner with and a couple of nutrition educators. And we created an educational program that was a month long with labs that we did before and after. And we would teach them how to eat whole food, plant-based nutrition, um, how to cook. We were doing cooking demonstrations. We had walks. We were going to the supermarket with them and, um, and then the labs. And, and after the first month, it was stunning the the labs that we were getting back uh, and all three of us the doctors we were all like this is like the best thing I've done in like the 25 years I've been a doctor it's so <laughs> satisfying and people were like why didn't my doctor tell me about this why doesn't more why don't more people know about this why is this a secret and I even had physicians in the group that were like why you know what's going on so I just got the bug then and 
we started running them monthly or every other month. Um, and this was in the summer of 2019. And then COVID hit. So we were able to do five and a half programs. The sixth one we finished a few months after COVID started and Zoom appeared. And so we finished remotely over Zoom with, with that cohort. But um, it was during that time, COVID, that I, that I made the transition because I was working just seeing, you know, suspected COVID cases one after another after another. Everything else got sidelined. The work environment was horrific with the with the N95 mask. We were in a basement on a computer all day long. And I'm like, this is not the life I want to live. I love what I was doing before. So I kind of restructured what I was going to be doing. I quit my job. Um, I gave my notice like six months ahead of time after kind of taking a break in a little log cabin in, in Vermont, I was like, I need a break from this. And, and it was crystal clear. As soon as I got away from it, I was like, I, I, that was a lovely chapter, but I'm done. And I'm ready for this new and different and completely different chapter where I'm doing what my heart is telling me to do. And nobody's giving me guidelines that you can or can't say this or that. And I no longer have to prescribe milk. And <laughs> So yes. <laughs> that's how Plant Dots was born. And we restarted in the summer of 2021. And I have been doing it full time ever since. And I've switched it over to a nonprofit. And I'm just expanding it, doing consultations, cooking classes, classes for cancer survivors. And then we run these Jumpstart Your Health is what we call our month long program four or five times a year. Um, and now it's remote or in person because of Zoom. We gave up all the cooking demonstrations in place of cooking together. So I cook in my kitchen in our, with the other two plant docs while the participants, you know, we send them the ingredients and they cook. And it's like in order to be successful with these lifestyle changes, people need the tools to learn how to do it. So we do a breakfast, lunch, and dinner when we cook together. And I'm available all the time. People are texting me and emailing me during the program. So it's kind of a concierge program where I hold people's hands. I want them to be successful. And I just get no better joy than seeing those labs afterwards and people um, not needing to go on their Lipitor or coming off their blood pressure meds or reversing their diabetes. It's so satisfying. Well, for those of you that are listening to this and aren't seeing this on video, I just want everybody to know that Sandy's entire persona changed talking about the past to talking about the future. It is incredibly different. <laughs> you just have your face lit up, you're smiling more, you have all this energy. So yeah, it's undeniable that you have so much more gratification doing what you're doing now. And you're very passionate and enthusiastic, which is also like that energy that you transmit into, you know, to all your clients now, I'm sure that that also helps them on their journey as well. So they know that you're excited for them. You're on their side. You're there to cheer them on, to coach them. So that's, that's really, really important. So how many years total did you work in pediatrics before you made this transition? About 25. Wow. That's, that's long enough. Yeah. <laughs> you put your time in. <laughs> you put your yep. time in, that's for sure. And so what do you have like a story that you can share with us? Like one of your favorite stories from one of the participants in any of your um, jump starts or current client or anything like that? Sure. I have a couple. One, I think that's so important and kind of highlights what you were talking about, um, about body size was... In the same month, I had two very thin women that um, that joined the Jump Start, and one of them, their doctor, she was saying, "I just haven't been feeling right for months." And the doctor said, "Look at you, you're thin. Like, why? What? Do, why do we need to do blood work? You're fine." Like, and then she came to me, and we were talking about, you know, the way I eat and about whole food. And she's like, "Yeah, I don't do that. I she eats a lot of French fries and fast food and." She just has a thinner body. And when we did labs, she was pre-diabetic. She had a very high, she had, her LDL is like 165. Um, and she was like not healthy on the inside. At a cellular level, she was 
eating all these toxic, you know, processed foods. And so I, you know, I think that was just a really important, you know, case. It's not about body size. Um, but after the month, she reversed everything. She took it, like, went all in and was, like, so excited. And um, all her labs normalized, both of them. They were incredible. And then the other thing that I love seeing is um, the diabetics that come in, the type 2 diabetics that have, like, A1Cs and the 7s or 8s. And, um, you know, so they're not, like, super well controlled and they're they're used to having these high sugars and they're on insulin within one or two weeks and it's just mind-blowing they're they're getting low sugars and they need we need to keep dropping you know i send them to their own doctors but they need to keep dropping their insulin because their cells are waking up and starting to you know be receptive to the insulin again where they had all this resistance and all we did is give up animal products and start you know cutting out all the oils and eating all these nourishing healthy foods and all of a sudden there I could just picture these cells starting to be like oh you know <laughs> happy cells starting to work and and the patients are amazed you know that they're that they don't need the insulin but it's that's just such so satisfying yeah, hardly anybody understands the power of food that they've never been told. What they've been told instead is, this is it. You have this for the rest of your life. It's going to be these medications. That's it. Right. So, you know, count your carbs or whatever, but that's the only diet instruction that they're given, really. But that power of fiber and getting that fat mm -hmm. out, it just really does. It unclogs everything and helps that engine rev back up, be like, oh, we're ready. We're ready to do this. That's amazing. Well, given all of that and all that you've experienced over your whole career thus far, what do you wish more people knew? Um, I wish people knew that the, the disease, the chronic diseases they're being dealt are not like concrete. It's not like, I, I feel like everyone accepts it as inevitable because you see everyone around you, you hit 50, everyone's going on a statin. Like that's normal. It has become normal to have high cholesterol and need a statin. It is normal to get high blood pressure and go on a blood pressure medicine. What I feel like is missing is they're not told there's another choice. You could try changing your diet and you may not need those meds. And, and so that's the message that I, I feel so frustrated. Um, and, and I think part of, I, I, I get it, you know, I've been a physician, there's no time. And, and maybe, you know, these physicians don't have the expertise or the knowledge or don't know how to get their patients um, on that track, you know? So that's what I'm hoping with Plant Docs, I'm trying to reach out to physician groups to let them know I'm here and I can do it for you, you know, and, and this is an option. And I know not everyone's interested. That's fine. But I want people to know they have a choice. Like, did yes. you know you could your diet, change your diet might help? Like, if they're not told that, then they, that, that's what's missing. People don't know. Absolutely. I think it needs to be part of informed consent because mm. I think it's not right that we don't give patients that information because then they can't really make a choice. You know, if, if they're just like, okay, basically your choice is either you do take this med or don't take this med, but they're not giving the choice of, or you can make a lifestyle change and that could be just as effective or even more effective without side effects or only beneficial side effects. Like they're, they're excluded from an entire choice. Right. So well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's medical neglect? to not tell your patients that the food they're eating is causing their disease. And I that think the food it is. they could be eating could cure it. Yes. Right? I definitely think it is. But at this point, I feel like I can't blame physicians because most of them have never heard that information themselves. You know? Right. They're not educated. I feel, you know, like I feel we need to get to that point where that becomes part of our standard training 
Right. And then we could be like, all right, <laughs> this doctor, you don't go to them because they never give you this option. But right now it's like, it's yeah. not even in their head or, or there's just so much misinformation, like these doctors that are getting into these other diet styles, like people doing carnivore, like, oh my gosh, so frustrating. So, so yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I it agree. needs to be, needs to be, a, that education needs to be given to patients and they should at least be given the option. So all right. Well, I want to know a little bit more about you. In your bio, you said that you enjoy sweater alchemy. I have no clue what that is. Tell us what sweater <laughs> alchemy is. I think I love the word alchemy, like you make something really special or um, valuable out of something that's, you know, the the, the raw ingredients. It's, all, it's the concept of like trash to treasure. I love pulling things off of someone's curb that they're throwing out and then bringing it home and gluing it and fixing it and painting it. And then, then sometimes I'll just put it out again and someone will take it. <laughs> but, wow, um, that's so generous. <laughs> this is sweater alchemy. If you take old cashmere, wool, alpaca, they have to be like natural fiber sweaters that have like moth holes in them, someone's throwing them out and you wash and dry them, it gets all felted. So you can literally cut it with scissors and it won't unravel, where normally if you cut a sweater, it will completely unravel. And then you sew with it. So like these are mittens made out of three different sweaters that have like cashmere cuffs on a, from a sweater that was getting thrown out. And this is a, um, a bl blanket I made. It's just like a patchwork with a bunch of sweaters. <laughs> wow. That's sweater alchemy. <laughs> That's so interesting. I did not know it was going to be this interesting. So basically, <laughs> you want people's old natural fiber sweaters that they're going to throw out so that you can make other things with it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And I'm sure it's you could make some beanies and like all kinds of stuff too. Nice yeah. warm things. Purses. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Endless. <laughs> You, you can make a an apron for your cooking classes. That might be warm, though, if you're cooking outside. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I love it. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, we have some more time. I'd love to know if you have a morning routine. Yeah. I, um, I have mixed – my body has mixed feelings about coffee. First of all, I, I know it has polyphenols in it, and they are antioxidants that are good for you. Um, or I'm very – passionate about organic products because we have so much contamination in our um, food supplies that are not organic, but coffee is one of them that if I'm going to drink it, I want it to be organic. So, but if I have it all the time, um, I don't like if I don't have it, I then will get a withdrawal headache. So I don't like the dependence on the caffeine. And sometimes I'll get stomach aches, like acid stomach aches, and it seems related to the coffee. So I'll go, I go on and off coffee all the time. But my current routine is my boyfriend makes an espresso, organic espresso, and then I take the end of it so it's not that strong. And then we froth oat milk. So it's nice and, and the low fat, not you don't need like the, the creamer one um, because when you froth it, it gets thicker. And then I add a product called Jamu, J-A-H-M-U. It's um, a spice combination of turmeric, ginger, cardamom, black pepper, um, clo um, cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg. I don't know if I already said that. There's like 10 different spices. It's wow. very good. And I feel like I'm getting all those delicious antioxidant, anti-inflammatory spices in my morning drink. And I also put in mud water, M-U-D-W-T-R, which is a California company. They make um, like powdered mushrooms and like um, cordyceps and lion's mane and, you know, all those like really delicious um, mushrooms. So I add that to it too. That's my morning drink. And then I usually have pumpernickel bread with avocado, or I have my homemade granola, which is on my website that has no oil and sweetened with maple syrup and lots of nuts and dried fruit. <laughs> sounds delicious. It almost sounds like you're having kind of like a chai latte mushroom coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That. <laughs> That's very unique. I don't think I've heard anybody have that exact combination of things in it, but that's really cool. I don't drink coffee at all. Like I am super 
incredibly sensitive to caffeine. Even if I have too many pieces of chocolate, I start getting like palpitations. So I can, there's mm. no, it makes me feel yeah. awful to have coffee. Um, but I've tried the mud water before because I got it for my husband because I know for sure he also has stomach problems from coffee, but he's like, I will die before I stop drinking coffee. So he does it. He just sometimes has to take an antacid. I'm like, dude, just go off. Coffee. He's like, no, <laughs> over my dead body, over my dead body. I'm like, okay, fine. It's your life. Um, so I, I got him some mud water <laughs> to try, but it did not what convert him. Oh. I, he didn't love it. So, but I, I gave it a try. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, whenever your partner is trying to get you to change, it's never a good thing. So right. anyway, all right. Thank you for sharing that with us. Well, Sandy, tell us where listeners can connect with you and what products and services you offer, how they can access those. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Well, my website is Plant Docs PVD. Um, it's short for Providence. P V is in Victor, D is in Dog. dot com. And on our website, we have um, all the different programs that we have available. One is our our main month long one is Jumpstart Your Health, which is our you know labs before and after. And now since COVID, we have the remote option. So we've been having participants from all across the country. Um, participate along with the people that are want to come and do it live. We do we do them at the same time, half and half. We have twenty remote and twenty live. Wow. Um, yeah, and then I started um, a program for I love this book, Foods to Fight Cancer, the Gloria Gemma Foundation in Rhode Island, which is um, a support and resource resource foundation for breast cancer survivors. Um, they asked me to do a plant strong plant-based kind of six-week program for their community and it turned into me kind of you know researching about which foods have the strongest anti-cancer properties and it was eye-opening again how many people in that whole oncology field are not really addressing the importance of nutrition in cancer um so i i do that like twice a year i have a program it's a four-week all remote class that's it's just one hour it's just part education like which are the foods and then we do a 40 minute quick dinner using that food so think like mushrooms and onions and then a mushroom stroganoff mm. for example and then i have cooking classes because i feel like that's a big part of people being successful i wanted my graduates to have something where they could keep tapping into plant docs and having us help them um, so last year we used Dr. Greger's How Not to Die cookbook and used all his recipes that are oil free and where every ingredient's a gift for your body. And this year we're doing global plant-based global cuisine. So every month we um, visit a different country, including all the blue zones of the of the world. So this and this coming Sunday we're doing one on Okinawa, Japan, and oh, um, and it has the plant doc twist. Um, of, you know, something I think people would like to learn about and using some of the foods that a lot of those centenarians from Okinawa eat. Um, but that's really fun. I love doing that. That's also fully remote. I send out the ingredients and we all cook together. And then I do private consultations, remote or in person, um, tailored to whatever people need. So those you're are busy. offerings. <laughs> yeah. You're doing a lot of stuff. So there's something for everyone there for sure, whether it's, you know, a small investment in time or a more intense, you know, intensive experience or something for everyone there. And I think um, many of my listeners hopefully will check out your website and see if that aligns with what they're looking for. So that is fabulous. Okay. So before I let you go, leave us with your top three tips for parents that want to raise their children with a strong nutritional foundation, but also a healthy mindset around food. Um, I always go to breastfeeding as number one. I just, it, I, I was a lactation consultant as part of my background too. And I just feel strongly about that's the best first food for children. So, mm -hmm. but if we're talking past those years where that's too late, <laughs> the next step is, I feel like we do a really good job at, you know, parents do a good job, the information's out there. For like the first complimentary foods, we're doing fruits and vegetables, but then things go awry after one year. So 
I would advise parents to keep thinking about the choices that you made initially. Those are the foods that kids should keep eating, fruits and vegetables, and, and expand their palate, but don't introduce sugar-sweetened beverages and processed foods and um, white bread, because it, it's hard to go back. Um, yes. So it's better to just keep doing those fruits and vegetables, and kids will love them if they always get them. Um, and I think the, the other thing is the home cooked meals um, as a family is really important um, to get away from the fast foods and, and learn to cook together as a family and eat together. Mm -hmm. I love that. Those are all great tips. And I agree, like in my book, I talk about, especially if your child isn't in an atmosphere yet where they're being offered all of these processed foods you are able to direct what they're eating because that's all they know. They're, they, all they know is what they're offered. So do not offer the juice and the French fries and the goldfish crackers and all this stuff. Of course, once they get out of your home and they're being exposed to other things, it becomes a little more challenging. <laughs> but yeah. there's, there's uh, different strategies for those uh, stages as well. Well, Dr. Musial, it's been great. Thank you so much for being a guest on Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you for Thank sharing you. with us your journey and everything that you have been through and all of the wonderful work that you are doing now. I appreciate it. I'm so grateful for you. And I know that all of your patients and clients are too. So thank you so much. And I hope that you have a plantastic day. <laughs> Thank you. So nice to meet you. Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.